much for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the things that you are about to teach us. Thank you that we have the opportunity to come here and to worship you. Thank you for a beautiful summer. Thank you for each person here. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be welcome here this morning, Lord, and that we would lift your name up and glorify you today. We'll, may we leave here edified and encouraged. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. And God's people said, Amen. So there's a few announcements this morning. Uh, we're putting meals together for Lane Scott on a weekly basis. So basically the idea is if you make a meal for supper and you have one plate worth of leftovers, maybe throw it on a disposable plate, wrap it up and bring it to the church, and then we'll be able to take meals out to Lane on a weekly basis. Uh, he can't eat very much, so you don't need to save him a lot, but it certainly does help. We would like to put together some meals for Jordy and Paige, too, as their hands have become full recently. Congratulations, by the way. So if there's anything we can make for them, a casserole, a dish, a supper, or whatever, take it over to them. I'm sure they'd appreciate that. As well, speaking of Jordy, Jordy, Jenny, and Holly are getting baptized today at Whitney Lake at 3 o'clock. If you'd like to come and join us. Please do so. Please come celebrate with us. Uh, gentlemen, Pastor Kevin Nelson has invited us, gen us men to the Lutheran Bethel, sorry, the Bethel Lutheran's Church Iron Men's Fellowship. Say that three times fast. And that's on Saturday, August 13th at 10 a.m. If you're interested in some fellowship and some discussion, come on out to the Bethel Lutheran Church on the 13th. On the 14th, we're going to have a campfire Sunday, so that's next Sunday. We're going to have a campfire at my house at 5 p.m. Please bring a lawn chair and a dessert or a salad, if you can. And let's just get together and roast some hot dogs and sit around a campfire for a while. Uh, I believe there's one more announcement. Cheryl, was there a video that you needed to share? That's all I've got in my bulletin. Okay. Oh, there I am. Okay. So thank you in advance for supporting us with all the things. You could bring it in on Sunday, your cookies, or you could bring them in during the week, um, but not Friday. We're not here Friday. Okay. Um, what else? We are going to have a team meeting next Sunday at the church at uh, 7 o'clock, I believe. So you can go to Matt's Wiener Roast, and then just walk over here to the church. So we're going to meet with all the teens who are going to be our helpers, and we'll do a little bit of team building, get to know who everybody is, and then we'll just go through what we are expecting for the week. And we really love these teens that come and help the younger children move from station to station, um, help them when they're doing games, help them with Bible study, um, help them just behave while they're sitting with the group here in church and it's been wonderful what we've had in the past years for teen helpers um, I've heard from several families that aren't going to be here so if you think that you're going to be around to be a helper gosh we would sure love to have you and especially you ones who've been here and know how our VBS works okay um, is there any other there's Next Sunday, Tammy would like to call a Sunday school meeting right after church. Just a quick meeting for the Sunday school teachers. Okay. Um, I know there was one more written up there, but I don't remember what it is. Okay. 
We'll show a little quick video here. PBS meeting Monday at 6.30 here at the church, if you can make it. Could be tomorrow. Oh. Oh. Well, did you hear that, Dave? Lorraine's giving you a shout-out online, so she can come up and sit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Glad you're safe, buddy. Enjoy working. Between me and you, I'd rather you go to work and me stay home. Okay, at this time, I'll invite the worship team to lead us in worship, please. Thank you. If you weren't sure that we're living in the last days, watch TV. <laughs> There's lots of stuff going on, and it does feel to me like it's, um, it's like the Bible says, it's in the birth pains. They're increasing in intensity, they're increasing in frequency. Paige doesn't have any idea what I'm talking about, I know. <laughs> Would you stand as we sing about the days of Elijah, the days of Ezekiel, and the days that we're in right now? Everything in the Bible is relevant to us today, and we can worship the Lord no matter what. Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah, there's no God like 
Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and the trumpet call is your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Thank you for participating. You don't have much for instruments, but you've got, you used what you've got, and I appreciate that. I think the hymn is next. Is that right? Yes. Another good one. If you're tired of standing, feel free to sit down, but we do encourage you to keep on singing. start again. I was, I was watching, watching to make sure we had, had the right verse. verse.
this might not be that good, but if it is well with your soul, it's okay. Jesus walks with us, he talks with us, and he gives us hope in all of life's circumstances. Uh oh. Oh, this is the book I want. Thinking, what have I done? It's communion today. And sometimes these um, traditions might feel a little tedious. Oh, here we are, it's another month, we do this again. But it's perfect to remember. Remember the body and the blood of Christ, the sacrifice he made for us. Please call the ushers forward for our offering today.
Could you please stand with me and sing the Dark Tower D together? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for another beautiful day, another opportunity to worship you. Jesus, thank you for the cross, and thank you that we can call you our friend. There's so many implications that come from that. The freedom that we have to worship you, the boldness that we can have to come before your throne, the resources that you've given us here on earth to use for your kingdom. We thank you for all of it. And we thank you that you've given, that, given to us in order that we can give back to you. We ask that you would bless these gifts, that you would use them in the furtherance of your kingdom and spread your gospel throughout the world. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay. My favorite part of the service again. But I'm not giving the story this time. That's for someone else. Come up and have a little object lesson. It's not really a story this time. It's an object lesson. Do we have any kids? I don't know how to put my legs and look like a lady. There we go. Let's try that. Hi. So how's summer? Don't you just love summer? I do. I love summer. This is... Probably not rocket science for anybody. Asking the little kids first. I know you guys know everything, the big kids. Do you know what that is? Anybody know? Go ahead. What is it? Chalk. This is chalk. I had every intention of coming with a whole truckload of chalk and sharing with everybody, but I can't find my new box. So I didn't bring any chalk for everybody to share, but oh man, just touching it. There's white on my hands. Does chalk always do that? Oh. Yeah. With all of the colors. Blue, everything. What do you do with chalk? What's a good thing to do with chalk? Right on the rocks? Color on the sidewalk? Yes. On the blackboard? How about you? Or the, well, you could write on the whiteboard, but you better have colored chalk, because the white chalk on the whiteboard, mm -mm. yes? Sometimes on paper. Chalk writes on a lot of stuff. You know, I could write on this carpet, and you'd be able to read it and see it. What's kind of cool about chalk? Why would I not want to, say, pull out my paintbrush and paint something on the carpet? Why? Because it's fun. Why? Why wouldn't I? It is fun. But what if I used a marker? Or what if I used a paintbrush and painted on the sidewalk in front of the neighbor's house? What do you think would happen? They, that's bad. <laughs> They'd be grumpy. Because it doesn't come off. Yeah, you're right. The best thing about chalk is that it doesn't last forever. If you write on something, I was going to have a chalkboard, but I didn't. But if you write on something, you can just wipe it off. You can just wipe it out. There's a verse in the Bible in Acts chapter 3 that says, you could. It says, repent and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out. Just like chalk. Does anybody like to write stuff? I do, and I did as a kid. I'm going to tell you a funny story. It wasn't funny to me at the time. I was just little, and I discovered pencils. And you know, I could write on the walls. And I was backing out from under the crib once upon a time, and my dad knew what I was doing. And so he gave me a big boot in the rear end. 
and I didn't, I didn't write on the walls for a while, but then I learned a new trick. I signed my brother and my sister's names, and I wrote their names, so it looked like they were writing on the wall, not just me. So I don't recommend that. I'm just telling you my sordid history. But when we do something wrong, sometimes we do something wrong, oh, it's just a mistake. We can ask Jesus, and he'll forgive us. He wipes it out. Sometimes we do something wrong on purpose. We're just mad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But if you color on the wall with chalk, you just wipe it out. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we do something that's bad and we know we're doing bad, sometimes we're just mad or grumpy or whatever, and we bug somebody in our house or we make them grumpy. When we ask Jesus to forgive us, he does the same thing, just wipes it right out. So if you're ever playing with chalk this week and playing on the sidewalk or writing on rocks, just remember, you can wipe it out just like Jesus wipes out our bad things. That's right. You shouldn't put it just in any one place. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you wipe out our sins. We thank you that we can ask you anytime. We ask your blessing on the kids as they go to church. Amen. It's hard to remember to be quiet, isn't it? Thank you for listening. It's time for Children's Church. Thank you, Sandra. And thank, thank the good Lord, Lord that our sins, sins have been, been our slates, slates have been wiped clean, so to speak. Well, to continue in our series this morning, I'd ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 2. Chapter 12, not chapter 2. Matthew chapter 12. We've seen Jesus kick off his ministry. We've seen him do a few miracles, and today we're going to see him step into the face of some people that challenged him. We're going to see him share his identity of who he really is, and uh, he really doesn't hold back any punches. He, uh, he says it how it is, and I love that about him. He's just straightforward, shoots from the hip. And so let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and then dive into this fascinating chapter of the life of Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you for the fact that you're here with us this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding our day, our morning. I pray that you would use me to deliver what words you want spoken. And I pray that nothing would come from my lips that you don't want to be heard. I pray that you would be welcome here this morning, and I thank you, Jesus, for this chapter in your life where you identify who you truly are and you make it very clear why you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you that we can call you a friend, and, and thank you that you were willing to go to the cross on our behalf. Thank you for these conversations that teach us so much. As we open your word, Lord, this morning, we pray that we would be edified and encouraged and walk away having learned something new not, not just about you, but just to get closer to you and who you really are. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, at this point in Jesus' ministry, there's some growing tension between the Jewish establishment, the Jewish leaders, and Jesus. And it starts to come to a head while he's in Jerusalem. As Jesus continues to perform miraculous healings, he comes in direct, direct confrontation with the most zealous for protecting God's law. These people were so fearful of ever breaking God's law that they had erected kind of a hedge around the law. In other words, to say, we don't want to break the law, so we're going to put laws in place that are boundaries before we even get to the point of breaking the law. They became very legalistic. 
and it, it just comprised of all sorts of extra rules and stipulations that the Pharisees and Sadducees had put in place. They would refer to that as the oral law as opposed to God's written law. Yet out of a deep desire to avoid offending God, these leaders were at, in fact driving a wedge between themselves and God. The debate that ensues here in the chapters that we're going to read regarding the lawfulness of healing on the Sabbath contrasts the heavy burden placed on the people and the religious leaders with the life-giving message and ministry of Jesus their Savior. What we need to keep in mind for the next couple of chapters that we read is basically the Jewish leaders had imposed such strict stipulations on everything that you did that it really drove you away from seeing God's kindness and mercy and the character of the law that he had written down. Legalism had snuck into what the Pharisees and Sadducees were all about. And the people were almost fearful of them that they would be caught doing something this or that wrong, something they may not even been aware of. There were so many rules and stipulations, as we're going to see. And Jesus doesn't say that the, rule, the law is wrong. Jesus doesn't step in and try to abolish the law. He actually fulfills the law. But what he's getting at here in this couple of chapters is your written law, this hedge that you've put in around God's law, is damaging your relationship with God. And we're going to see how legalism takes that kind of effect on our relationship with God, too. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some of the heads of grain and eating them. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested, Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Now, they weren't actually breaking God's law. They were breaking the Pharisees' law. Jesus said to them, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he came, when he and his companions were hungry? Hungry? He went into the house of God, and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests were allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I tell you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. Jesus really comes out with the truth right away here. First of all, he says, I'm greater than even the temple, which would have really made them quite angry. That would have been blasphemy almost. And then he says, he quotes scripture to them. I want you to know the meaning of this scripture. Now, he's talking to people that have spent their entire lives studying scripture. They knew this verse, but he brings it to their attention for a reason. He says, I want you to show mercy and not offer sacrifices. In other words, you're missing the point. Your legalism is like offering sacrifices. You are showing no mercy to anyone around you. These people are hungry. That's why they're picking grain and eating it right now. And God's law has nothing against that. So cool it is basically my translation of what he's saying to them. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Now this really would have triggered them. He called himself the Son of Man, which would have been seen as blasphemy. And he said he was Lord over the day that God set apart for us to rest. Verse 9. Then Jesus went over to their synagogue, where he noticed that a man with a deformed hand was there. The Pharisees asked Jesus, does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? They were hoping he would say yes so they could bring charges against him. And he answered, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. 
Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored, just like the other one. Then the Pharisees called a meeting on how to plot to kill Jesus. So we can see that Jesus' ministry was off to a good start, and the Pharisees are already plotting to kill him. Please turn with me to John chapter 5. Now, this chapter we're about to read in John chapter 5 could be a parallel to the passage we just read in Matthew. Or it could be a different circumstance altogether. We're not quite sure. But a very similar story nonetheless happens. John chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. Now, you may notice in your Bible, some of you may notice that verse 4 is missing out of this chapter. It is supposed to say in verse 4, waiting for a certain movement of the water, for an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person step in the water... <coughs> in after the water was stirred, was supposed to be healed of whatever disease he had. Now that verse has been omitted for a specific reason. It's basically because these people believed something that was false about this pool. They believed that an angel would come down and stir the waters and that the first person to be in the water would be healed, but that wasn't actually the truth. The truth is that this pool was built on top of an underground stream. Once in a while, the water would bubble to the surface and make the surface of the water bubble. And they would think it was an angel stirring the water, but it was actually a natural cause. And no healings actually took place in this pool. But it's interesting to note that scholars believe that over 300 people on a regular basis would sit around this pool waiting for a healing to happen. All of these people would be sick, lame, um, crippled. Something would be wrong, and they would spend day after day after day, about 300 of them, waiting at the edges of this pool for the waters to be stirred up so they could be healed. While Jesus is at this festival, since there's a festival going on in Jerusalem, it's estimated that there could have been up to 3,000 people sitting around this pool at this time, all waiting to be the first person to get into the water. But can you imagine being a crippled person waiting to get into the water, trying to be first out of 300 or 3,000? The chances of getting into the pool first are slim to none. So pick it back up in verse 5. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. 38 years. Speaking of this pool, this name Bethesda is supposed to be, the name means house of mercy. Bethesda, pool of Bethesda would mean house of mercy. Fun fact, when you see the word Beth in the Bible, that means house. So when you heard here uh, the word Bethel, that's Beth, house, El, God, house of God. In this case, Beth, Bethesda, house of Ezda, mercy. However, by the time Jesus arrived at this pool, it wasn't a place of mercy. It was a, more like a hangout of misery. So there's a man there who's been sick for 38 years, sorry, crippled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? This brings an important point. I think that we often miss, maybe I have missed it when I read this the first couple of times. 
when Jesus saw him, he knew that he had been ill for a long time. Now, people will tell you that the Bible says that God only helps those who help themselves. Right? It's in there, right? Have you ever found it in there? It doesn't say that. The Bible does not say that. It does not say that God helps those who help themselves. Benjamin Franklin said that. Scripture does not say that. And Jesus proves that when he comes to this man who could not help himself. He was trying to help himself, but there's no way he could get to this pool to be first into a pool where a miracle didn't actually exist anyways. And so Jesus comes to him and he sees him in this situation, and I think the way Jesus saw him is the way that we need to learn to see people. He saw him and he had mercy on him. Having mercy on somebody all starts with the way that we see them. If I look at you and I'm automatically judging you without knowing you, I've already made it, made it impossible for myself to have mercy on you. I don't understand your situation. All I've done is judge you based on appearance or first impression. And that's not fair. Jesus looks at this man. This man doesn't know him. Jesus looks at him with mercy. And he asks him a question next that almost seems a little bit cruel. If you were sitting there right next to them and heard this conversation, you know this guy's been sick for 38 years, and this guy randomly walks up to him and says, would you like to get well? It's like, yeah, no kidding. Of course I would like to get well. But Jesus asks him out of compassion, and the man replies in verse 7 and says, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. And then Jesus says something that you might think was even more cruel. This guy's been laying there crippled for 38 years, and he tells him, stand up, pick, your mat, pick up your mat, and walk. If I was listening to this conversation, not knowing who Jesus was, I'd go, are you nuts? The guy's been here for 38 years, he can't walk. Why would you tell him something like that? But that's, but that's the thing, thing about Jesus, Jesus, is he never gives us a command without giving us the ability to follow through on it. He never tells us to do something unless he will willingly provide us with the strength to carry it out. And that's exactly what he provides with this man. Instantly the man was healed, he rolled up his sleeping mat, and began to walk. Instantly the man got up after 38 years of not being able to walk. And I think that sounds, that can reflect back onto our lives too. The Lord challenges us in some pretty interesting ways. He asks us to do some pretty interesting things. Like, see that impossible person over there? That person that drives you nuts? The person that nobody else wants to talk to? I want you to love them. Oh, that wasp we want it. We get pretty upset. I don't want to love that person. But the Holy Spirit comes into that situation and gives us the ability to love that person. You remember a few weeks ago I talked about somebody who had been a bully to me in high school. I can guarantee you that throughout high school I had about that much love for that guy because he picked on me consistently. But the Holy Spirit kept coming into that situation and reminding me, hey, you need to love him. There's not a lot of love going on in his house. And, and that's, that's, what, that's, that's why he's jealous of you, because you have love in your home, and he needs to see what, your, what Jesus is doing in your life. So I want you to love him. And he gave me the strength to do it, even though I didn't want to very bad. Another example. Something that was impossible, something that God, Jesus, commanded Peter to do. Peter called out to him when Jesus was walking on the water. And he said, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. And Jesus said, come. And Jesus said, or sorry, Peter steps out of the boat and falls flat on his face into the water and sinks. No, he steps out of the boat and walks on water. Now that's something I would love to see because as a Canadian, I do that every, week, every winter. It's called ice skating. 
but there was no ice on this lake. Peter was walking on water, something that is physically impossible for a man to do. And God provided him with the ability and the strength to do so. It's the same with this crippled man. God tells him something that's impossible for him. Get up and walk. Well, I haven't done that in 38 years. This man could have been born that way for all we know. He gets up, he rolls up his mat, and he walks away. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. Verse 10. So the Jewish, le Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry your sleeping mat. Now, again, God's written law does not say that you can't roll up a mat and carry it on the Sabbath. But their oral law, that hedge that they had put around the law of God, said that you couldn't carry a mat on the Sabbath. God's law does not say which work you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 10, do no customary work. It's not specific. So the religious leaders then added their oral law and decided on 39 things that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. So these guys essentially played God and decided what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. Which, which was wrong. wrong. But, but for example, example, they said you couldn't carry anything that weighed more than the equivalent of two dried figs. Do you know how light figs are when they're dried? Technically, if that was the case, I wouldn't be allowed to carry my Bible up here today to preach out of it. If I didn't have it up here last night prepared for me, ready to go, I wouldn't be allowed to carry it up here today, according to the Pharisees. It's, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. We, we can see, see how ridiculous, ridiculous that is, but this is how scared the Pharisees had become of breaking God's law. They were so fearful of God, they were so bent on upholding His Word, that they lost contact with the God of the Word. Their relationship with Him was severed because of legalism. So verse 11 this man has just been told that he's not allowed to carry his mat on Sabbath, but he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. So of course that's what he did. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning, or something worse might happen to you. Well, I don't. First of all, what's this man's response to being healed? Does he run around and tell all his friends first? He probably wanted to. But no, he doesn't go and tell his friends or his family. He immediately goes to, well, where did Jesus find him? He finds him in the temple. He finds him worshiping God. He finds him thanking God. This man hasn't been able to move in 38 years, and the first thing he does is he goes to worship God. He makes up for those lost 38 years, and he's in the temple. He's thankful. He's grateful. And Jesus is probably proud to find him here. But then he says something to him that's a little bit odd. He says, now that you're well, stop sinning, or something even worse might happen to you. Now, what could honestly be worse than sitting beside a stinky pool for 38 years waiting for your legs to be healed? This man has been through a lot. I mean, he sat there crippled, wishing every day that he could be the first one in that water when it stirred so that he could be healed. For 38 years, he lived without any means to provide for himself. He probably had to beg in order to eat. He probably had to have family and friends support him. He couldn't contribute to society or his family. He's been through a lot. What, what could possibly be worse than that? Well, well Jesus, Jesus is warning him about the same thing he's warning you and I about. Don't spend eternity separated from Jesus, from me. Something worse could happen to him. If he continues to sin and does not have Jesus as Lord in his life, his eternity is in hell. And that is a lot worse than the 38 years of suffering he had just faced. Jesus, out of his mercy, warns him, hey, if you don't get right with God, 
if you don't accept Jesus as Lord, 38 years of being crippled is going to seem like nothing compared to an eternity in hell. And yet, out of mercy, he warns this man, hey, pay attention to where you're going when you pass on. So, it's one of the most merciful things we could do for someone else, too, is to tell them the truth about that. They may not like to hear it. People don't want to hear, hey, you're, you're going to hell if you don't have Jesus. They don't like hearing that. I don't like hearing that. But it's the truth, and it's one of the most merciful things we could ever say to them. So, so verse 15, then, then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. And then we get Jesus' reply. And I love how he doesn't hold back. He's respectful. But he says a lot. There's a lot of red letters coming up in my Bible. Jesus replied, My Father is always working. Now, some of my notes got cut off here. Oops. Um, the things that Jesus is about to say, it either makes him a lunatic and it makes him a liar, or it makes him God in the flesh. When he says, my father is working and so am I, he equates himself to God. That, in the Pharisee's eyes, is blasphemy. And Jesus doesn't equate himself just one way with God. He does it in five ways. In verse 17, he says, my father has been working and so am I. I do the same work that the father does. Now, this would have got their eyebrows raised and their blood pressure up right away. Because what he was saying could have been blasphemy. Unless he was actually God, and then it would be true. But let's ask ourselves a question. Jesus is on the Sabbath right now. Did God quit working on the Sabbath? No. The universe is still running every Saturday. On Sabbath. So he works while we rest. Jesus says this and moves on. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he had not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. So first he says that I'm equal in purpose with God. Now he's saying I'm equal in performance with God. Whatever the Son does, the Father also does. Verse 21. So, no. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. Verse 20. In fact, the Father works... Sorry. The Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. For just as the Father has given life to those who, to those who he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. Now Jesus is saying, I'm equal to God in power. The Son gives life to anyone he wants. Now, they did not see this coming. They would not have even expected the Messiah to be able to give life. Verse 22, in addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, the Son has been given absolute authority to judge. Now Jesus is saying, I'm equal to God in the proclamation of judgment. So that everyone will honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. Jesus says, I'm equal with God in purpose. I'm equal with God in performance. I'm equal with God in power. I'm equal with God in the proclamation of judgment. And I am equal with God in praise. If Jesus shares purpose, performance, power, and judgment with the Father, he certainly deserves the same praise as the Father. This was quite 
quite the statement for him to make. New Testament scholar Andreas, the last name I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I'll butcher it, has noted that the Jews at the time of Jesus were not expecting that the Messiah would be able to raise the dead to life. It wasn't even in their scope of thought for him to be able to do this. So when he says it, they are absolutely stunned. So Jesus' claim to be able to give life not just to the dead, but also to the living was a revolutionary thought, to say the least. In a society committed to monotheism, which is the worship of only one God, the claim of co-regency with God, to be equal with God, was either the grossest kind of blasphemy or it was the absolute truth. Jesus forced them into a corner and required them to make a decision. There was to be no sitting on the fence. Jesus is saying to them, look, I am who I say I am. I am the Messiah. I am equal with God. But that's not the end of the discussion. He continues in verse 24. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. And if there's one thing to take away from today, that would be this verse. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. We know that when Jesus returns, those who are dead in Christ, when he comes to rapture the church, those who are dead in Christ will rise out of their grave, they will hear the voice of God, and they will be given eternal life. We also know that those who have died without knowing God will be raised on the final day of judgment, and they too will hear his voice. And he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Verse 28. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, judgment is just, because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. If I were to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would be valid. And according to Jewish law, Jesus is hitting right on the head here. You needed two or three witnesses to testify for you. If you testified of yourself, it's invalid. But someone else is also testifying about me, in verse 32. And I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist, and his testimony about me was true. Of course, I have no need of human witness, but I say these things so that you might be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message. But I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. So there's Jesus' two witnesses right there. I have John as a witness, but he's a human witness. I'm going to let my actions, my miracles, my teachings do the speaking and the testifying for me to testify who I really am. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has testified about me himself. You have never heard his voice or seen him face to face, and you do not have his message in your hearts because you do not believe in me, the one he sent to you. You search the scriptures because you think that they can give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me and receive this life. That's a pretty interesting point. He's telling these Pharisees that they believe the Bible itself can give them eternal life. They're mistaken. The Bible can't give me eternal life. If I were to read this book cover to cover and never encounter the Lord Jesus, this book would not give me eternal life. It would be a pretty excellent read, but it would not give me eternal life. 
Jesus says that the scriptures, all scriptures, point to him. But there are those who receive to come to him to receive life. Your approval means nothing to me, because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name, and you have rejected me. Yet if others come to you in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Yet it isn't I who will accuse you, because before my Father, Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, in whom you put your hopes. He's the one who wrote their scriptures. He's the one they put their hope in. If you really believe Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But since you didn't believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? Now, Jesus did not say any of this to these Pharisees to simply prove them wrong and kind of smush them into the dirt and ha ha, I was right and you were wrong type of thing. That's not his motive. He said earlier in verse 40, no, nope, sorry. He says, he says earlier that I'm saying all of this so that you might be saved. He's essentially saying to them, your legalism has driven a wedge between you and God, and I'm here to pull that wedge out. You need to see that God desires mercy, like I showed to this man on the Sabbath and healed him. It's not wrong for anyone to do good for another person on the Sabbath. Would you guys wake up just for a minute? I believe Jesus may have said something like this. Maybe he didn't. I'm not trying to put words in his mouth. But you guys just wake up for a minute. Your laws that you put around God's law have made it so impossible for people to even breathe that you wouldn't even allow a man to be healed on the Sabbath? You wouldn't even allow a man to be shown this kind of kindness on the Sabbath? Because you're scared of breaking God's law? That's, That's a pretty, pretty harsh reality to live in. And I believe overall this chapter and the, the reason that this is in the Bible is to show us that God does not want rigid, legalistic religion. He wants our heart. He wants us to show mercy, kindness to others. And if that involves on a Sunday that we need to go do something kind for someone... It's, it's okay, okay if we, we break, break a sweat while we're doing it. it. That's, That's okay. That's totally okay. okay. God isn't some bully that gets a kick out of making suffering people squirm and compete and race for his healing power. Think back to that pool. Think back to what was going through the minds of the people that were around this pool. If I'm just the first one to get in that water, I'll be healed. God will get a hold of me if I'm the first one in that water. But the people around me, I mean, if they're second, third, fourth in line, too bad for them. Or if I'm third, fourth in line, too bad for me. Well, that's cruel, and that is not how God's mercy works. That's not how God works. He wants us all to be healed, not just of our physical afflictions like this man was, but like Jesus said to him, I want you to be rescued from an eternal separation from God. God's home is a house of mercy. His home should be called Bethesda because it is a house of mercy. There's another aspect to this that I think we need to take into consideration. And Max Lucado summed it up really well. He said, hatred, hatred is the rabid dog that, that turns, turns on its owner. Revenge, Revenge is the raging, raging fire that consumes the arsonist. Bitterness is the trap that snares the hunter. And mercy is the choice that can set them all free. So that begs the question, how do we choose to see those who are around us? Are we going to let rape, hatred consume us? Revenge consume us, or are we going to show these people mercy and look at them with compassion? We may not understand their story, but we can choose to show mercy. 
And number three, one of the most merciful things that you could possibly do for another human being is to share the gospel with them. Like I said, people aren't going to want to hear that they're going to hell. But one day they might thank you for warning them. So I'm not saying get up on a soapbox and start pointing your finger at people. But I am saying that when the opportunities come for you to share what the gospel really is, and believe me, believe me, we get those opportunities every day. Let's be encouraged to share it. And to know that the most merciful thing we can do with someone is to show them the truth. Because without it, they spend an eternity separated from God. With that truth, they spend an eternity with God. Most important decision they'll ever make in their life. Let's pray. pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you for stepping into human flesh when you didn't have to. Thank you for viewing us with compassion when you didn't have to. Thank you for seeing people who needed a savior when you didn't have to do anything about our sin problem. Thank you for choosing to do something about our sin problem. Thank you so much for your mercy. Lord, thank you for healing this man who had been sick for 38 years. And thank you for the testimony that it left on history, that it got wrote, wrote down for us to learn from. Thank you, Lord, for identifying yourself for true, who you truly are. And Lord, may we never let anyone convince us that Jesus never claimed to be God. Instead, let us point them to John chapter 5. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, like, like many of our songs said this morning, Jesus came to do more than just miracles. He came down to earth to lay down his life for you and I to make a sacrifice that would pay for all sin for all of the time, all time, and last for all of eternity. So as we start our communion service today, I'd just like to read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And if you'd like to follow along, you can. We'll start in verse 23. The Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which has been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And it is my prayer that he returns soon. In the meantime, though, let's honor him by partaking in communion together. But first, let's just take a couple of minutes to examine our hearts in silence. Is there anything I need to come to the Lord about and ask for forgiveness for or something that I need to deal with with him, or is there something I need to thank him for? And I think the first thing on that list would be the fact that he sacrificed himself for you and I.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can call you our son, our friend, our brother. Thank you that you sent him to redeem the lost so that you could have your family back. Thank you that we've been adopted back into your family through the blood of Jesus Christ and through his amazing resurrection. We give you all the praise and the glory and the thanks today for the fact that we have eternal life because of what your son Jesus did on the cross, Lord. And I pray that if there's anyone in this room or listening online that does not know who you are and what you've done, that today's message, something about the service, or something you do later would just witness to them in a way that they cannot deny. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much that we have eternal life. We've not only just been healed from the physical things that slow us down, but we have been healed from the sin problem that separated us, separated us from you in the first place. Thank you so much, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, the table is now open for anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ. Please come and partake. The bread symbolizes the body of Christ that was broken for us. And the wine symbolizes the blood that was shed for us. Let's partake together in remembrance of the sacrifice that was made for you and I.
Would, Would you please, please stand, stand and join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, Thank you, you may be seated. So that'll mark the end of our online portion of today's service.